trust I'm holding up The substance of your hope and love The substance of your hope and love In your hand I'll face the stars In your will I'm pressing Spring of, uh, of 1978, when the Hokulea had overturned uh, far beyond the, the channel, and they had spent a, a night in, in the water. Some of you certainly know the story, maybe others don't, but uh, uh, one crew member decided that he wanted to try to make a paddle for Lanai. He estimated it to be about 12 miles, and after several attempts by the captain to persuade him not to do it, then uh, when light came and they realized that soon the opportunity would be gone as they were drifting further out into uh, open ocean, uh, Eddie Aikau got his surfboard with a strobe light and a couple of oranges and, uh, and stroked, stroked off uh, into, uh, into the night. Uh, by the next day, a boat did find the Hokulea, you know, and, and rescued them, but uh, Eddie Aikau was, was never found. Thus, the bumper sticker, though very faded on most cars these days, Eddie would go. And uh, again, Eddie would go because of trying to remember his, uh, his sacrifice, uh, his courage, his determination, uh, and so forth. And probably criticized by some at the time. Oh, if he had only waited, if he had not gone, if he had been more patient, you know, he would have been saved too. But I doubt that uh, any of those crew members were, were ever critical because they, they understood what he was, what he was doing. Well, we're looking at a passage of Scripture this morning that, uh, in another way, uh, as we look at Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, what she does in this passage of Scripture, uh, according to Jesus, is so important, it ought to be told every time the gospel is told. Jesus predicted it. It ends up in Scripture. Uh, it's part of our passage this morning. When it comes to worship, we might say, Mary would go. <laughs> Uh, in terms of those same kind of character qualities uh, that I've just mentioned. Matthew does something else here, too, that, uh, is, that we've noted all along. He does not record the events in chronological order. He picks and chooses sometimes because of topic that he's trying to arrange the material together. This morning, in a very Jewish rabbinical way, he takes uh, two, two people that couldn't be greater in contrast, and he puts two events together. It begins... With Jesus, we'll see, announcing the fact, once again, of his death, his upcoming crucifixion, and we have a time frame in terms of Passover. It's two days away. Then Jesus takes an event that happened four days earlier, Mary anointing Jesus, and brings that into context and places it right here, because what happens after that, we have the betrayal of, of Judas. I don't think you can get a greater contrast between Judas and, and Mary of uh, Bethany. And, and I think hopefully it'll impact your life this morning. Let's take a look at uh, verses 1 to 5 where Jesus announces his death. Again, we're in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him, but not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot. Uh, a couple of things about this. One is the obvious Jesus announces the Passover is two days away. And again, I think he's putting it in context so we understand what he's doing here, what I just explained. Uh, intentionally, he's taking an event out of context and bringing it into this context that we can uh, see uh, this tremendous um, contrast between someone who had such, uh, such privilege, Judas. He was an apostle. He had been with Jesus for three years. He'd experienced the power uh, of God. He was in the boat when Jesus came walking on the water. He was there when, uh, when the thousands were fed. He was there for all of it and heard all the teaching and probably could recite what we know as the, uh, the Beatitudes by heart because they, they had to learn these things. Uh, he experienced all of that. 
uh, and yet we see him and we know that he is the, he is the betrayer. And what we'll find out is that as he betrays Jesus, it wasn't the first time that he was a betrayer. Contrasting that to, uh, to Mary. And so he tells us Passover is two days away. We know that he intentionally inserts uh, Mary's episode, I think, for, uh, for a purpose. Uh, again, emphasizing the importance of Passover. Uh, the Jewish leadership does not want to kill him on Passover uh, we'll see that Jesus is obviously in control of the events. Secondly, again, announcing he'll be crucified. He's been predicting that uh, all along, uh, and uh, as we've mentioned, but they don't seem to get it. They understand when he says, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be crucified. Uh, and even as you remember, P Peter even protests at one point and says, that'll never happen. You know, and he has to say, get thee behind me, uh, Satan. And uh, uh, they don't seem to understand. Nobody seems to understand, except one person seems to understand, Mary. Again, the, the contrast. I think uh, the, these words are inserted here to help us understand the distinction of this one, one person. They don't get it, but someone does. And then we have the mention of the chief priests, the elders, announced the timing uh, of his death. Uh, in most, most manuscripts, the better manuscripts, uh, include the word scribes and uh, and that's important because then it tells us this was an official meeting of the Sanhedrin that had gathered in the, and again, it does correctly say the palace, not the home, the palace of Caiaphas. They were wealthy. They'd become wealthy uh, because of their corruption and ripping off the people in the temple. Again, the reason Jesus drives uh, the, the money changers and the uh, animals being sold for sacrifice out of that temple only days uh, prior. If you tour Israel today and go to Jerusalem, one of the places you normally go to is the Palace of Caiaphas, where you can go and stand where Jesus did in his personal torture chamber that was in the, uh, the basement uh, of the home. When we talk about the corruption of the Jewish leadership uh, at this time. Uh, that's, uh, that's well known within Judaism uh, as well. Uh, and as we know that uh, many of these leaders, as it turns out historically, were not even Jewish. Uh, but, uh, but running, running things here in Jerusalem uh, at that time. There's another dynamic going on that we read about in John chapter 12, verse 9. Some, they're plotting the death of, of not only Jesus. There it says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their, their faith in him. So this plot is not just for the death of Jesus, but it's the plot for the death of Lazarus as well. And as we've mentioned on, on more than one occasion, it is the raising Lazarus from the dead there in John 11 that sets in motion all of the events that lead to the death and the resurrection of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Jesus delays his coming when Mary and Martha call for him, waiting for Lazarus to be be dead and in the tomb so that he can come and, and call him forth from the tomb, knowing at that point in time, this is a well-known family, a fairly wealthy family in close vicinity to Jerusalem. The professional mourners from Jerusalem would already be there. And when he calls Lazarus from the tomb, even CNN would have reported that and probably gotten it accurate, uh, that, that people would have heard. That leads to the events of what we call Palm Sunday uh, and the people hailing him to be uh, the Messiah in fulfillment of, Ze of Zechariah's prophecy. And also in fulfillment, they lay branches down uh, in fulfillment of a Jewish feast, the Feast of Sukkoth. So all of that transpires, but it begins with this. The chief priests, the Sanhedrin, realize that, and now they want, <laughs> they want to kill Lazarus as, uh, uh, as well. But uh, what we see is that God is, is in charge of all of these events. So there's an announcement once again of his death. And then we see that Jesus, secondly, is anointed for his death. Uh, and that's really at the heart of what we want to look at in verses 6 to 13. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. 
When she poured the perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. You think this is a fairly important story? I think so, according to what Jesus says right there at the end. Uh, first thing we notice, uh, Jesus is anointed in order to honor him. But there's some other honoring going on, of course. Yeah, they're in the home, of course, of, of, uh, of Simon the leper. That tells me he's no longer a leper. <laughs> if he's in his home and they're in his home, he's not a leper any longer. Obviously, this is somebody that's been healed by Jesus. According to the, the law, according to the Torah, they would not, uh, he would not be able to come near the city limits, much less his own home, and would have to cry out if anyone came near him, unclean, unclean. So uh, this is a man that's been uh, healed by Jesus. His life has been uh, radically changed uh, by Jesus and now he's doing something to, to honor Jesus. And um, I think that's the proper sequence of, of events, that uh, when your life has been touched by the Lord and healed this way, uh, our life should be lived in such a way to honor him. Uh, Lazarus is there, and Lazarus honors him as, uh, as well. And uh, all Lazarus had to do to honor the Lord was show up. <laughs> is that the guy? Yeah, that's the guy. Is he the one that was dead? Yeah, he's the one that was dead. Wow. And he doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to give up and wax eloquent, give some kind of testimony. All he's got to do is breathe. <laughs> and people are like, wow. <laughs> Everywhere Lazarus went, because, uh, because God had done uh, through, uh, uh, through Jesus and this miracle such an incredible thing, all he had to do is show up. Uh, and we know people like that. We, uh, uh, we had um, one, of the, one of the gals visiting us back a few months ago. Her, her family attend her here. And she was on the mainland and uh, had cancer and so forth. And uh, obviously, a lot more people than, uh, than us were praying for him. But we were praying for her. And, uh, and God uh, touched her and healed her. And uh, the cancer was uh, gone and, uh, and everything. And so she jumped on the plane, came to visit and so forth. And it was, uh, it was great. That's Paul and Debbie Allen's uh, uh, mom. So, uh, and uh, so when she was here, I, I told her, I said, hey, you're like Lazarus. You know, I go, you, man, it's a blessing just to see you. You know, you're, you're a blessing wherever you go. All you got to do is show up and say, I'm not dead. <laughs> That's a pretty good blessing right there. God is, still does miracles, still heals. And, uh, and so Lazarus certainly by his presence was honoring Jesus. But the story, of course, focuses, and uh, by the words of Jesus, the attention is on Mary who honors him by this uh, anointing. Uh, she wasn't a leper, but she understands it's a time to, uh, to uh, honor the Lord. She hadn't been brought back from the dead. In a sense, there was nothing miraculous about her life. She didn't have the, the place and privilege of the apostles, as Judas did, but she understood that this was a time to, to honor the Lord. Uh, the next thing that we see is Jesus defends the woman, Mary. Again, we know it's her from John's gospel who anoints him and he says that she's done a, a beautiful thing. Uh, and again, uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 1, where we have the incident there, a few more details. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining with, at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance uh, of the perfume. And I want to talk about this event, certainly, but a couple of others. And, uh, and the, reason, the reason for it is that, in, according to the words of Jesus, Mary was anointing him for his burial. That means Mary got something and understood the gospel, even though Jesus keeps saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. Nobody seems to hear the rise again. Except for, except for Mary, except for this one, uh, one person. Because of that, or how does she get this insight? Why does she get something that nobody else gets? Uh, even though she, maybe she didn't have the, uh, the privilege the apostles had in terms of time with Jesus and hearing the teachings of Jesus and so forth. Well, she's only seen three times in Scripture, and every time we see Mary, she's always at the feet of Jesus. Uh, one of those incidents is recorded in, in Luke chapter 10, verse, verse 38. Uh, and here she's at his feet listening to the word. Story familiar to, 
to most of us in terms of the Martha Mary uh, argument here. Verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Again, the, the lesson I think for us, certainly the obvious one is that uh, uh, we really, as uh, in the words of Ian Bounds, we, uh, you know, he who is little with God will do little for God. Now, you can serve the Lord, you can do things uh, on his behalf, but if you're not spending time with him, you'll become a Martha. I don't think Martha started out as a complainer. <laughs> I think she became one at some point in time. And Jesus is not saying, hey, you shouldn't serve, you shouldn't do that. Uh, but at the same time, Mary's chosen the better thing. And again, our point is, when do we find Mary only three times? And each time she's at the feet of Jesus, this time listening to the word of God. I think she got the John 15, 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you'll become a Martha. <laughs> you'll become, you really can't do anything. Uh, again, the mission of the church is evangelism, sharing the gospel. But the purpose of the church is worshiping God. And sometimes we, we get uh, the cart before the horse. Uh, again, verse 40, it says, And Martha was distracted. Too much to do. So busy serving, she didn't really have time to, to listen to the Lord. Uh, we might say she was busy, but, uh, but not blessed. Uh, she's redeemed. We see in John 12, uh, at this time, though, uh, in that passage, uh, she's serving and, and no longer complaining. I think she understands the, the words of Jesus. The second time we see Mary at, at the feet is in John 11, kind of the classic scene. It is when her brother has died, Lazarus has died and been placed in the tomb. And let me read that to you, John 11, 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Again, uh, the contrast, Martha, Mary. Martha shows up on the road. Hey, Jesus is coming. He's coming from Jericho. She hits the road. She's going to meet him far down the road as she can get. And basically, she lays into him. <laughs> she just chews him out. Uh, a little different reception with, with Mary. She's at his feet. She's crying. If, if you'd have been here, you could have done something. I know that. But but uh, I want to at least suggest that on her knees, there's an act of submission, which is far different than what, uh, what Martha was doing. They both knew the, the miracle working power uh, uh, of God and, and, and Jesus Christ. One's on, on her knees in tears. Uh, the other one isn't. Again, Martha seemed, uh, seemed to miss it so often, and, and Mary seems to get it. And I want to suggest, again, it's because... Primarily, when we see her, she's always at the feet of Jesus. And uh, it's speculation as to why Jesus wept. Uh, he could have wept because of the unbelief. He could have wept because of the, the pain that was being caused them, though it was only temporary. He knew that what he was going to do, and he knew what needed to be done uh, in terms of, uh, of raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, and I think the, there, there's, there's the same for us. There are times when the Lord wants to do something. We're crying out. We're praying. There's something desperate going on in our lives. And the, the Lord's saying, I can't do that right now. It's just not the right timing right now. And, and, uh, and I think what he's really hoping is that we'll be a, a Mary and not a Martha. Somebody that either way, whether he answers our prayers and does what we want and what we sometimes demand, and sometimes when we say, and do it right now quickly, that uh, there's a sense that uh, I think what he would really would desire to see in our lives is to, on our knees and in tears because we're hurt, but accepting whatever his will is and whatever his timing is. But Mary seems to get that, yeah, even though many in Scripture and our own lives would testify that we miss it so often. 
And then our text, Mary worships at his feet as she anoints him with, with the perfume. I think this is a really a, a misunderstood passage uh, for a, a couple of reasons. Um, uh, and just to put the, the passage together, it's recorded in Matthew and Mark and, and also in John. Uh, and what transpires, and remember, they're reclining at a table. They don't sit in chairs like, like we do. They would sit uh, kind of on their left side and eat with their, their left hand, even as they do in a lot of places in, in the Middle East uh, uh, today. And I know they still do that in uh, India when I've been there. Your feet are this way, so you could understand why she would have access and be able to anoint his feet. But we also know that she anoints his head, she anoints his feet, and then she does the unthinkable for a Jewish woman. She takes her hair down. You don't do that in public, but she did. And then she wipes his feet with her hair. Uh, it was a great statement of uh, just tremendous humiliation and humbleness uh, before the Lord. The other thing that's happening here, because uh, I don't know about you, I read this and I read the word perfume and then I read John's gospel and it says, and the fragrance filled the whole house. And I'm thinking, peacocky, I know that's what it smelled like. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when those lays are in a room and it just kind of permeates, if there's anything that smelled good that permeated the room, it, it had to be that, you know. Uh, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. Uh, it was something uh, quite, quite different. Uh, in fact, the, um, the, the word in the Greek is, is pretty clear. Uh, it's, uh, it's myrrh. And, uh, it, it, and we know, at least if we study Scripture even a little bit, that's, that's associated with death. John 19, eventually when Jesus is basically mummified uh, with uh, alloy and, and myrrh. When um, we talk about the room being filled with this scent, what kind of a scent was it? What? You know, I've smelled uh, a myrrh before. It, it, you know, has a subtle odor. It's nothing like I, I thought it would be. It doesn't smell bad, though, or anything. But to them, it would be the smell of death. You know, when uh, uh, sometimes, occasionally, we have an opportunity, have an opportunity to go out and meet with uh, some of the Navy chaplains out here on the base and kind of get a little briefing what's going on with uh, our guys and gals as they're headed back from Iraq or Afghanistan and uh, a concern sometimes uh, about the whole post-traumatic stress uh, that they might go under and the idea that they would uh, sometimes be more willing to come talk to a knucklehead like me uh, being a civilian rather than a Navy chaplain all because of they might be concerned about their career. They just want us to be aware and they kind of apprise the situation, talk a little bit. It's a great time, really appreciate it. But one of the things that I, I've learned about that is that, you know, is there's triggers for it and certainly sound is one of the triggers about the most powerful trigger, though, is smell. Uh, we don't often associate that, but just a smell can take them right back uh, again. And, uh, and that's what's going on here. There's a smell in the room, but to everybody in that culture, that smell was burial. That smell was death. Do you understand how this changes the atmosphere of the room a little bit? Jesus understands exactly, obviously, what's going on. Uh, not just Judas, but all of the disciples are indignant. You know what that word means? It means they grumbled under their breath. <laughs> They're all doing that. that. Literally, that's what the Greek word means. It's not, they can even, it's not that they can even understand what they're saying. They're just, all, just grumbling under their breath and, uh, and rebuking her harshly, it says. Uh, and Jesus comes to her, to her defense. Anytime anyone is this sold out for Jesus Christ, they're going to be greatly misunderstood. What is it that she exactly did? What were they were complaining about? They were complaining about not that she anointed his head, but the price. A year's wages. A year's wages? What, what's a year's wages? 20 grand? 30 grand? That's what she dumped on his head and on his feet. You can understand their part. It's like, Oh, I think it's a little over the top here. <laughs> yeah. How about a couple hundred bucks worth? You know, I mean, because it's going to run, run down his head and on the floor here eventually. What, what is going on here? Any, anytime you make anything uh, a, a, a sacrifice to the Lord and you make Jesus Christ the priority of everything that your life is about, you will be misunderstood and you will be criticized. Look at these three incidents. Her sister Martha misunderstood when she sat at Jesus' feet to hear him teach the word. 
you're going back to church again? Weren't you there last week? <laughs> Judas and the other disciples misunderstand when she anoints uh, his head and his feet. What, what could have been done? We could have made a lot of money from this. Her friends and neighbors misunderstand when she comes out of the house to meet Jesus after Lazarus has been, been buried. Not, not to be surprised when the criticism comes. But notice Jesus immediately comes to her defense, explains that what she did was to prepare him for his, his burial. It's not, the, it's not the first time that we see this mention of myrrh. Remember the, the wise men that came. We don't know how many there were, but there were three gifts that were given. One of them was gold, appropriate for uh, the king of the kings. That's what they said. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? And, uh, and so they bring gold, appropriate. What else do they bring? They bring frankincense, which is used for making incense for worship in the temple. Appropriate gift for someone who's a priest. And then they bring myrrh, appropriate for death and burial. Boy, that kind of had probably uh, Joseph and Mary probably. Uh, we'll take the two, for two gifts and kind of you guys can take that one back with you. Uh, of course, they, they understood, not that they fully understood, but Mary had already been told, you know, that a sword will pierce your own soul too. Uh, she, she, whether she grasped it or not, she, she had some information, some inclination that, that he was going to die, although she may not have grasped it all till, till later. So it's not the first mention of this particular gift and, uh, and what it, uh, the significance it would carry in terms of his death. Uh, again, Jesus doesn't criticize the disciples because they're concerned about the poor, but he is concerned that Mary understood something that they had missed uh, totally. Uh, it, it's also interesting that she'd never used the, the gift on her own brother. I mean, her brother had just had died. I mean, again, they're not, they're not aware of the fact that Jesus is going to show up three days later. He's buried, but she doesn't use the, the myrrh with him. She's saving it for Jesus. I mean, she, she really under, understands. Some Bible writers have suggested because of the cost of it that this may have been her dowry, certainly by age and what we read about them and having the home than themselves. There's no indication their parents are around. We have these two single gals. A dowry would have had to have been paid if she was to be married at some point in time. Uh, and there's a lot, it's an awful lot of money laid out at one time. Some suggest that maybe it was money that would have gone to a dowry that she's using for this occasion. But she seems to understand something that no one else seems to understand. She did not go to the cross. It was Mary, the mother of Jesus, that went there. She did not go to the tomb. It was Mary Magdalene that went to the tomb to anoint his body. No, Mary stayed home, and she waited. She alone seemed to get the big picture of what uh, the others had so missed. The third thing here is, is that, uh, as we've mentioned, Jesus' disciples were indignant over his being anointed, and um, they believe the perfume should be sold, the money given to the poor, and really exposing that certainly the true character of Judas, and, and he's the other person that basically uh, this patch is, focuses on, that there might be a contrast between Mary and, uh, and Judas. But uh, we don't want to let the other disciples off the hook. Mark's gospel, Mark 14, 4 says, some of those present were saying indignantly, that's that word again, <laughs> grumbling under their breath to one another, why this waste of perfume? It, uh, it could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. It's pretty radical when you think about it, what she's doing uh, and what's, what's happening. You would think this would be this incredible, you know, holy moment, just this awe, this I get it now. I smell the death. I realize what's going on. Jesus is going to die. This is all upon us now. It's, it's hours away. Jesus has been... None of them get it. I mean, their, re their reaction is unbelievable uh, uh, when, when you think about it. Uh, and of course, uh, and, and they're all in on it, but uh, Judas is the, seems to be the, the instigator, the concern. And the concern for him was the fact that uh, he held the, the, the bag of money, he held their, their treasury, which tells us a couple of things is that he was considered to be a quite upstanding <laughs> man that everyone could trust. Well, who should keep the money? Don't let, it, don't let Peter have it, you know. 
Judas, or Judah, his name means praise. Hey, let's give it to him. We can trust him. So he's holding the money. But when it says that he was a thief, uh, it's a very interesting term. It's, it's, where, it's klepto. It's where we get our word kleptomaniac. Somebody that just steals habitually. Judas is somebody that steals habitually. A couple of things about this. One is the fact that, that, that Judas, when he betrays Jesus, he'd been a betrayer all along. He didn't start with betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He'd been ripping his closest associates, his closest friends, the people he ate with, he lived with, he learned with, he walked with every day. He'd been stealing from them all along. Thus, $20,000 down the drain, I could have skimmed probably a couple of grand right off the top and nobody would even notice. And that's what his real concern is. That's what his real motive is. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But uh, again, sometimes uh, you have people from a, a secular sense that want to make Judas out to be a martyr. Uh, he was no martyr. This only reveals his, uh, his true character. And it says something uh, about him. I haven't told you a, a Safeway story in, in a long time. My, uh, my brother and my uncle retired from Safeway are here. We'll tell this story in uh, honor of them. But when I used, to, uh, I used to be the assistant manager at uh, the Enchanted Lake store, worked at the store for a little bit <laughs> back in the early 70s. But uh, over there, we'd get a call once in a while that uh, uh, you had professional thieves that, that would come through to shoplift. And uh, the professionals come through and, and they want uh, meat, liquor, and cigarettes because they can sell those to the Korean bars for cash. That's, that's what they do for a living. They're professionals. And, uh, and, but you kind of get to know them uh, after a while, and you'll get calls from other stores describing them and in case they come by. And so the way you, you deal with it, you really don't want to catch them. Uh, you want to prevent it. So you just walk up, hey, how's it going? And you let them know that, can I help you with anything? No, that's okay. No, that's all right. Wherever you're going, I'm going. I am here to help you. And so by the time you, you shadow them down a couple of aisles and they realize you're, you're not going to let them uh, out of your sight, then they, they just leave. And that's kind of the way you deal with it. But there was another woman that would come in, and she was a kleptomaniac. I mean, she, I mean, she just, and what's funny about it, she's not good at it. <laughs> you do the same thing. She would dress outrageously. Uh, so she didn't exactly blend in. Not too many people wear white gloves, you know what I mean, when they're shopping at Safeway in the afternoon. She would wear the most outrageous outfits. <laughs> it was easy to spot her. And uh, I'd do the same thing. Go up, hey, how's it going? You know, can I help you? And just write with her, right? And, uh, and then she would try to steal right in front of you. No, nah, don't, you're, you're going to have to pay for that, you know. You're going to have to take it out of your blouse and pay for it, you know, up front. You can keep it there for now, but, you know, you're going to have to pay for that. Uh, and then she puts it in her cart. I mean, she would write in front of you. I have a name tag on. I work here. Are we clear about this? Kleptomaniac. Uh, weird. Weird. Uh, it, it's so strange uh, to think about Judas, that, he thought he, cons that he, he thought he was getting away with something. He wasn't getting away with, it, with anything. And, uh, and, and again, what he was doing was, was betraying his friends all along, and he becomes the chief critic of somebody that is sold out for Jesus Christ. That in the face of real, true worship, probably like we, we don't see anywhere in the New Testament here, according to Jesus and what he says. Does it get any better than that? When you preach the gospel, tell this story. Uh, that, that's very significant to me. In the face of that, he's, he's the chief critic. There is an Old Testament parallel. David, probably uh, one of the great scenes in his life when he's, trying, when he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And, uh, and the priests are carrying it on the shoulders. They're doing it the right way this time. And they're bringing it into the city. David wants, wants worship to be at the center of the hearts of the people. And so he wants it there uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, all the bands are playing, not just a couple of them. All the priests are on duty. Uh, all the choirs are singing. Uh, you know, when they, when they sing and they worship, you, you could hear it for miles. You could hear it for miles without any amplification. 
Uh, people are rejoicing. This is like a, a tremendous thing. David, at one point in time, as you know, takes off his royal robes that identified him as the king so that he would no longer be identified as the king. And in fact, if you, if you did a sweeping shot away, uh, you would no longer see him because he would blend in like one of the servants. In fact, that's what his wife, Michal, said, that he had disgraced himself. She put one of the great, great times of worship uh, in, in the Old Testament in terms of honoring God and his wife, Michal, becomes the, the critic uh, of, of the whole thing. You have disgraced yourself. <laughs> David says, you ain't seen nothing yet. My, my paraphrase, of course. And what happens to her? She's barren. No children, no nothing. She just kind of fades, fades off the scene. It's a terrible thing when we or those can find themselves criticizing somebody else because they're so sold out for the Lord and what they're doing for the Lord. And uh, if anything else, I think Matthew places this in here in contrast to Judas so that we understand what Mary did, that we'd be real careful the next time we might criticize somebody else and that it would actually be a, a rebuke to us in terms of our lack of honoring the Lord, our lack of commitment to the Lord, our lack of really worshiping the Lord. We, uh, and what I'm, what I'm hoping at the end, if we could just, Lord, say, pray, make me a, a Mary. <laughs> the next time we see Eddie would go, we'd go, Mary, <laughs> make me like that, Lord, because I think I'm missing something in terms of understanding what you want to do in and through my life. Let's go on. This last point is uh, there's an announcement, an anointing, and then of course, Jesus is abandoned just before his death, verses 14 to 16. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand them over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. We've mentioned it before, but it needs to be said again. Judas is the apostle who abandoned Jesus. I mean, he is called one of Christ's disciples in, in Mark chapter 3. He's called very early on. In, Mar in Matthew chapter 10, when all of them are sent out to proclaim the, the, that the kingdom is coming and to do the miracles that Jesus had been doing, Judas was among them. There's no indication that somehow he missed it and was not able to perform the miracles like everybody else. So I'll tell you one thing. Is it possible for somebody to do the miraculous in the name of Jesus Christ and not be a Christian? I don't think Judas was a Christian. Yes, it is. Does that, mean, does that mean we need to be very careful and actually hear what people are saying, not just what they're doing? And, uh, hey, I've run into this, and I've seen people that could do the miracle but don't believe Jesus is the only way to salvation, deny the Trinity, some other basic uh, uh, issues, and, uh, and they're out there today. We need to be very, uh, very careful. But this was a guy, again, my main point, that had tremendous privilege, uh, was an apostle, uh, was there for all the events that we've been studying uh, in, in Matthew's gospel. And secondly, Judas will abandon Jesus in fulfillment of a prophecy. And one thing is certain, Judas was not a victim of circumstances or what as some have called a passive tool of, of providence. He made his own choices. I've had conversations with people about this that somehow, again, Jesus is, excuse me, Judas is the martyr in all this. Hey, it was predicted, you know, it was prophesied he'd be betrayed. Someone had to be the betrayer. Poor Judas. Now, this is a guy that was a kleptomaniac. He'd been betraying others all along. This was just one more deal he cuts uh, at, uh, at the end. And in doing so, fulfills several prophecy. He sells Jesus for the price of a slave, according to Exodus 21. Zechariah said the Messiah would be betrayed uh, and the price used to buy a potter's field, which it was. Uh, a couple of verses, Psalm 41.9 says, um, Even my close friend, whom I am trusted... He who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Again, uh, David speaking, but fulfilled uh, with Judas. Psalm 55, 12, If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were raising himself against me, I could hide from it. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship as we walked with the throng at the house uh, of, of God. Because he fulfills prophecy, 
We don't make him a martyr. He made his own choices. Jesus warned him over and over again and even washed his feet in the upper room in the, in the last attempt to, to, in a sense, to draw him to them himself. But repeated, re, repeatedly refused. Satan, we would say, found a willing tool uh, in Judas. John 13, Satan puts the idea into Judas's mind. John 13, uh, we have the betrayal and, and Satan really entering Judas, being referred to as the son of perdition at that point. The last thing is that Judas then waits for an opportune time to abandon Jesus, and that time would come in the garden. We're familiar with it, but again, Luke's account, chapter 22. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And again, Son of Man, the term Daniel used for the Messiah, the term that Jesus used most often of himself. Judas was a man that lived for the material. He lived for this, for this life and this, this world. It was all about the money. It was all about possessions. He was a self-seeking, self-promoting uh, person. Uh, and though he had tremendous privilege and opportunity, he was a compromiser in his daily life. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I don't think he joined and became a, a disciple and apostle because he thought, and one day I'll be able to sell Jesus and betray him for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. I don't think it starts out that way. I don't think anybody starts out that way that make big compromises in their life. And again, that's compromised with Mary who lived to worship the Lord. And only she really understood the gospel. Only she understood the mission of Jesus, that he would die for the sins of the world, but he would, he would rise again. Knowing that, she would go. <laughs> she lived out her faith to the fullest. And um, I think we understand the gospel as well. In fact, I think we understand a lot more than Mary understood. So I think the exhortation for us is to be that kind of a follower and that kind of a worshiper as, as well. And, and I think on our part, I think all the Lord really wants us to say is, like so often when we read these things and look at them and we're so inspired by others, is just to say, I really can't do it, Lord, but I'm willing. You know, would you do a, a work in my life? You know, and he's, he's so faithful to do that. Father God, I come to you just as I am to seek your face. Take my hand and hold me near as you love for my soul once again. Love so pure, 
patient and kind, poured out on the cross for me. Father, your love, like a torch in the night, will guide my way. Father, your love gives me power to carry on. Father, your love. Like an eagle in flight above the storm, Father, your love takes away my fear, oh, Father, your love, like a torch in the night will guide my way, Father, your love gives me power to carry Like an eagle in flight above the storm, Father, your love takes away my fear. Here I am once again, I pour out my heart, for I know that you hear every cry. You are listening. No matter what state my heart is in, you are faithful to answer with words that are true and a hope that is real as I feel your touch. You bring a freedom to all that's within in the safety of this place. I'm longing to pour out my heart and say that I love you. Pour out my heart and say that I need you. Pour out my heart and say that I'm thankful. Pour out my heart and say that you're wonderful. Here I am once again I pour out my heart For I know that you hear every cry You are listening No matter what state my heart is in You are faithful to answer With words that are true And the hope that is real as I feel your touch you bring a freedom to all that's within in the safety of this place I'm longing to pour out my heart say that I love you pour out my heart say that I need you pour out my heart say that I'm thankful pour out my heart
the safety of this place in the safety of this place in the safety of this place in you I feel in you I see Everything the way it really should be In the water and wind and every new heartbeat Sun touch on skin light burning me Blood and wine Oh. 